Muy buenas tardes a todos ustedes, ingenieros que nos acompañan el día de hoy en esta gran maratón de puentes. Antes de continuar me gustaría pedirles un favor y es, si están escuchando bien mi voz, por favor eh, pueden reaccionar levantando la mano. Bueno, veo que ya algunos están reaccionando, muchísimas gracias por confirmarlo. Eh, quiero dar una breve introducción sobre nuestra compañía antes de iniciar con el webinar, sobre todo para poner en contexto a aquellos que nos están acompañando por primera vez y para que ustedes tengan conocimiento de lo que estamos haciendo actualmente alrededor del mundo y sobre todo para Latinoamérica. Bueno, ingenieros, les comento que Midas es una compañía que nace en Corea del Sur en el año 1989. Nos establecemos en Latinoamérica en el año 2018 de, en la de Medellín, Colombia, que es la oficina desde la cual nos estamos comunicando el día de hoy. Contamos con una red global de 10 oficinas regionales y distribuimos nuestros productos en 120 países. Actualmente tenemos más de 22.000 usuarios alrededor del mundo y en Latinoamérica contamos con 500 usuarios. Somos líderes en el mercado asiático, somos número uno en los Estados Unidos en el área de puentes y queremos hacer lo mismo en Latinoamérica. Estos son los programas que estamos distribuyendo actualmente en nuestra región. Nuestro programa estrella en los Estados Unidos y en Asia, Midas Civil. Nuestro programa para estructuras Midas Yen y nuestro programa para proyectos geotécnicos avanzados Midas GTS NX. Quiero también darles una información adicional. Este año vamos a estar realizando la segunda edición del Simposio Latinoamericano de Puentes. Se va a realizar en la ciudad de Bogotá, capital de Colombia. Vamos a contar con invitados internacionales y la invitación es a que ustedes, aquellos que les encanta eh, promover esas nuevas tendencias y dar a conocer sus conocimientos, puedan convocarse. Eh, estas son las líneas temáticas que vamos a tratar durante el evento. El evento se va a realizar los días 15 y 16 de agosto. Y si ustedes escanean este código QR, van a ser redirigidos a un formulario donde van a tener la información más ampliada y donde pueden inscribir tanto sus ponencias y les cuento que en caso tal de ser seleccionados nosotros cubriríamos todos los gastos de desplazamiento hasta la ciudad de Bogotá, alojamiento, alimentación y unos beneficios adicionales que vamos a comentarles una vez ya sean seleccionados como ponentes. La convocatoria va a estar abierta hasta el día 30 de abril. Hasta ese día vamos a recibir eh, todas las postulaciones. Luego vamos a pasar a un comité en el que van a seleccionar las ponencias. Eh, tiene que ser una ponencia relacionada con alguna de estas líneas temáticas. Y si ustedes necesitan más información sobre este evento, por acá también voy a compartirles mi contacto, mi teléfono y mi WhatsApp. Estas son también nuestras redes sociales para que nos puedan seguir y puedan estar al tanto de todos los eventos que vamos a estar realizando durante el resto del año. Bueno, ingenieros, entonces, dando continuación a esta gran maratón de webinar de puentes, el día de hoy vamos a continuar con nuestro segundo webinar acerca de lecciones aprendidas con fallas de puentes en los Estados Unidos. Este webinar va a ser realizado por nuestro querido ingeniero David Liu. David cuenta con más de 25 años de experiencia en diseño estructural y análisis de vigas de acero, vigas de cajón de acero, cerchas de acero, vigas de hormigón pretensado y puentes postensados. Espero que disfruten esta segunda presentación y damos inicio entonces. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And also I'd like to thank Midas to provide me this opportunity to give a presentation. The, pre 
then the topic of my presentation today is lesson learned from bridge failures in US. The purpose of this presentation is to provide some lesson learns for bridge engineers so we can learn from it and uh, to make sure they won't happen again. Here's an outline of my presentation. I will start with the Tacoma Narrows Suspension Bridge, which is the most uh, bridge failure in the world. It's a suspension bridge. Uh, the failure is due to the vibration. And the second one is the recent steel bridge collapse on I-90 near Philadelphia about three months ago uh, due to the truck, uh, due to a fire caused by a truck. The third one is a Florida Universe, uh, International University Trust Bridge collapse during the construction. The fourth one is the Sunshine Skyway Trust Bridge collapse, which leads to us to adopt the vessel collision specific design specifications. And the next one is the Cypress Street Viaduct. It's a pre-stressed, precast uh, concrete beam bridge collapse during this uh, earthquake in San Francisco. Then the next one is the Civil Bridge. It's a truss bridge collapse due to the eye bar. It's a fracture critical member collapse, which leads the bridge, US bridge inspection program, like to inspect the, to perform the routine bridge inspection every two years, once every two years. The next one is the Slap Town Road Steel Bridge over US 30 in Ohio. This bridge is caused by the collision when the truck when a truck is too high, while well, it's exceed the minimum vertical clearance, so they hit the steel girders. Then I will talk about a bridge collapse. It's a Jason Box beam bridge collapse due to the corroded steel strand. Uh, then I will talk about collapse of I-35W bridge, which is a very famous bridge, like a truss, deck truss bridge collapse in 2007, caused 13 people dead. Then I will talk about Marcy pedestrian steel bridge collapse, which is due to the steel girder buckling during the construction. And then the next one also the good collapse in San Juan Bridge in Arizona during the uh, precast express concrete beam bridge construction. Then I will talk about pretty famous Volcoda segmental bridge. Uh, the contractor found some cracking in the web of the segmental box during the construction. Uh, next one is the Leo Frigo Memorial Bridge. This one is, there's a, like a big settlement at the pier due to the corroded steel piles. Then the next one is, sorry. The next one is the, Scoharry Creek Bridge collapse due to the scour issue. You know, my screen freeze, I cannot hold on a second. Okay, the last one I'm gonna talk about is uh, I, it's a bridge on I-75 bridge class during the re demolition of the bridge. So I pretty much cover everything from design to construction, everything. So what are the causes of the bridge failure? Well, due to collision, like the one in Philadelphia, that's the one, well, that's not the, sorry, <laughs> the, the, the slab town bridge, that's when due to collision, then floods, the, the second last one, that's the, the floods will cause scour to cause the substructure failure will, may cause the bridge collapse. Unexpected events, accidents, construction incidents, like the last uh, bridge failure, then design flaws and the manufacturing errors, fires, that's the one happened three months ago in Philadelphia. 
Of course, the last one is due to the earthquake. Now I'm going to talk about the most of bridge failure, Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It's a suspension bridge built in, uh, I think around the 1938 or 39, about the same time, about the same time when they built the lines, uh, the, the, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. I think that this bridge failure is due to the vibration because the superstructure is too shallow. And the, the resin, I forgot how many people dead during the bridge collapse. This bridge failure leads the wind tunnel testing for all the major bridges, like a suspension bridge, cable stay bridge, long span arch bridge, so from the wind tunnel testing, then you can get all the aerodynamics characters to make sure you have to make sure the the stiffening girder is deep enough, and also the shape of the superstructure is good enough so to prevent the the resin or the severe vibration of the bridge. Oh, this picture shows the steel bridge collapsed on I-95 near Philadelphia about three months ago due to a fire from a truck. So you can see because the steel good, they won't take, they cannot res resist the fire well, pretty much like a World Trade Center. When two planes hit the World Trade Center, the two buildings collapsed when, when the steel when you have the high temperature, the steel girder will lose its capacity. This picture shows uh, after, well, the repair on this bridge is unusual. <laughs> they pretty much just close down the bridge, the roads under the bridge, and then they put the fuel with some, like a fiberglass or some special fuel so they can, that maybe that's the quick, quickest way to open the bridge because otherwise if you, try to replace the superstructure may take much longer to have the bridge open. This bridge, this picture shows the bridge collapse at uh, Florida International University. It's, uh, I think the, it's a trust bridge. They are using ABC, so combine a little bit everything. So before the bridge, Collapse, they notified the designer, bridge designer, they're be cracking, but they didn't close the bridge right away. So that's the, that's the problem. This is the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. I think the existing bridge is a trust bridge. I think uh, because the, this boat hit the pier, so caused the bridge collapse. So after this, then I to include the vessel collision design specifications. So make sure when you design the pier, or you have to design some dolphins or some some thing to or design the pier to take some like a, the vessel collision loads to make sure they can take understand they can take the loads from the boat. This is a Cypress Street Viaduct. Collapse, it's a pre-stressed, precast concrete beam bridge during the earthquake collapse. I think mainly you can see the column, maybe they don't have enough com confinement. So after that, it leads to lots of seismic design improvement to make sure that the column is ductile enough to take the seismic load. This is a very famous uh, civil bridge. It's a truss bridge. At the bridge collapse due to the, the eyeball intention. It's a fracture. Well, we all know the trust bridge, all the fracture, all the tension members are fracture critical members. So as long as one member collapse, the whole bridge will collapse. So from this bridge failure leads US to conduct the bridge inspection once every two years. 
This is the slab town road bridge over US 30. The, you can see the <laughs> the, the steel girder is a uh, is a uh, bend due to the well was hit by a truck over height truck. So I think in the future I'm suggesting right now everywhere you can see the way station for the trucks i think they might have to check the truck vertical clear clearance make sure they won't hit the bridge so this i didn't see any posting for the vertical clearance so i assume she meets the minimum vertical clearance required by the dot but still hit by the truck which means the bridge the truck is way too high way too tall yeah this is a uh, a bridge failure from Pennsylvania. It's a adjacent steel box girder bridge. I think of that for the well for any bridge built like a 30 or 40 years ago, there's an issue for the uh, steel stream for the adjacent box girder. I don't know. Either maybe the concrete cover is not deep enough or some other reason. So there are quite a few bridge failure due to the corrosion steel strand caused the adjacent box girder bridge collapse. So this picture shows the steel box girder section. The red is the corroded strand. You can see most of the strands at the, I say I believe this is at the center span. So you can tell the box being lose lots of capacity while well, severe corroded but it's tough to inspect i think uh, in the north dot i think they improve their adjacent box code details to make sure well to mitigate the steel strand corrosion in the future this is a very famous collapse of r35w bridge in Minneapolis. It's a deck truss bridge. I think they're finding it's a one gust of place under design. The bridge was designed in 1960s and the cost of 13 people dead. I heard that I think that the victim sued the DOT for $10 million. Then the DOT sued the, the company for $10 million as well. Here's another picture shows the, the collapse of the I-35W bridge. So after that, I believe the men that require all the major bridge designed without fracture critical members. This is a Mossy bridge. It's a pedestrian bridge. It's still, I believe it's a steel box girder bridge. You can see the girder is twisted during the construction. So that means uh, this picture shows the inside of box girder detail. So you can, so, so it's very important to make sure the steel beam is clapped. Uh, well, the steel beam is stable during the con construction. So it means you have to provide enough diagram, uh, diaphragms or internal or external diaphragms to make sure the steel girder won't buckle during the construction. Once the deck is hardly in place, typically the bridge should be safe. Here's another picture of twisted steel box girders. This picture shows the uh, pre-stress precast. Uh, concrete beam bridge collapsed during the construction. So uh, you can tell right away the end of the, the concrete beam is not braced. So if they brace the, the beam at the end of the girders should be okay. Here's the Wakoda bridge. The existing bridge is uh, it's arch bridge. The new bridge is a two cell segmental box girder bridge. It's a very wide bridge. There are only three webs. 
And uh, the bridge, I think it's over 100 feet wide. During the construction, they found some like a cracking during the webs, which means, uh, well, for segmented bridges, they are not supposed to be cracked because you design all the components with zero tension. So, which means you have to check all the principal stresses for every component. And here's the finished product. So I think after they found the, the cracking in the webs, then they hired person to perform the independent design. So then they proposed the internal post tensioning to strengthen the bridge, even the bridge, even the bridge, <laughs> even before the bridge was open to traffic. I think the cost for this rehabilitation may be around $10 million. Now I'm going to talk about the Leo Frigo Memorial Bridge in Wisconsin. This bridge, I think I forgot that, I think in 2013, they two, one or two piers settled by one or two feet because the corroded steel piles Well, of course, the, the piers settle. So you can see that after they remove the piles, they can see the severe corrosion in the steel piles due to the well, due to the very cosy, very cosy, very corroded. Well, very bad. I would say very bad the soil around the steel piles. So that means uh, during the geotechnical testing, they should test the soil if they may cause the steel pile corrosion. So you have to remind the designers to thicken the, the steel edge pile to make sure they have, a, well, after maybe certain years of service, they are still okay after corrosion. Yeah, this bridge shows collapse due to the scour, due to the flood. So. So that's another big concern when the when the bridge is built over the river or creeks. Yeah, this is the bridge collapse during the demolition during the removal of the existing bridge. So that means uh, especially for certain types of uh, like a steel bridge built a design long time ago when they have those pin connections. So you make sure the removal sequence is correct. Otherwise you may have this kind of problems during the removal or demolition. Now I'm going to talk about some I'm going to talk about some repair methods for steel bridge Damage typically used the strengthening to straightening or strength, strengthening on the damaged steel play girders. Or you can replace the, the beams, which cost much more money. Or you can strengthen in the damaged steel girder with plating with bolted connections. For concrete deck, then you typically use the epoxy seal on the cracking or use the partial or full deck repair. The last repair method, UHPC overlay, which is not common used. I think in Iowa, they they used the first UHPC overlay in US a couple years ago. Well, the problem is uh, they last much longer than the conventional asphalt or other concrete overlay. The problem is the UHPC is a very expensive material. They cost about five times higher than the conventional concrete. So they told me the UHPC overlay could last for over 50 years, which is very close to the bridge design life for a typical overlay, maybe last for only 10 to 20 years. Here's the this picture shows how to straighten in the steel beams. This detail is from Illinois DOT. So you can see they use some like a timber blocking, then they 
then they use some jacking to strengthening the girdle to make sure when they bend it, they straightening back. Here's another picture shows the vertical strengthening detail from Illinois DOT. This one, this detail shows the steel girdle strengthening. So if there's damage, that the girdle is may lose. The capacity is reduced, so you have to add a, a new place bolted to the existing girder to increase the, the girder capacity. Well, here just common superstructure repair for the PPC while pre stress precast the concrete beam bridge. Typically use the epoxy seal on the cracking. You can use the fiber wrap to increase the flexure uh, the the bending or the shear capacity. The last one, I don't know whether you could consider UHPC spray, spray because I heard the, in Naperville, in Illinois, they use the UHPC spray to strengthen in the manhole. So I think uh, maybe you can use to, to fix the problem as well. Well, here's just some common repair methods for the substructure. Use the epoxy seal on the cracking. Use the from the concrete repairs or mortar repairs for shallow repairs. Then you, you could use the fiber wraps. I think for seismic repair, then you can look at the, some Caltrans, some standards. Here's some like a scour plan action suggested by Illinois DOT. So typically, I think mainly you have to ins inspect the bridge like the, based on the frequency. So if there's an issue, maybe you should in inspect the bridge more than uh, less than five years. For typical underwater bridge inspecting, it's uh, once every five years. So in this case, you may have to in inspect the bridge maybe every year or two or three years. And also you have to monitor the condition of the bridge, identify the fixed scar monitoring device, which I don't know what kind of device you could use to monitor the scour or the potential of bridge, bridge collapse due to the scour. So if you notice the bridge touching the superstructure or the approach roadway being overtopped, then you have a big concern for scouring. Well, here's my conclusion. So I think from this bridge failures, I think we first thing as a bridge designer, we need to improve our bridge design. Like uh, for some major river bridge, I think we have to consider the vessel collision. I think uh, personally, I think maybe from now, we might need to consider the fire while well, the bridge damage due to the fire, maybe we need to spray something to protect the steel girder from collapse, like a like a building steel building steel like a building steel members. I think they spray spray some material to prevent the steel uh prevent the fire, and they also make sure we for especially for steel girder before. They pull the deck, make sure the steel girder is stable for both the steel girders and the pre-stress, pre pre-stress, pre-cast concrete beams. Sorry. Also, we need to consider some mitigations during the uh, bridge design. And also we need more research on emergency repair on the bridges. How to make the bridge repair faster or use some new material, use some like a new construction method. Well, that's the end of my presentation. Any questions? First question we have is, do they need to be preheated? Um, I assume it was in regards to the last. Yeah, for steel, you're right, for steel girders, if it's co caused the damage, 
I think uh, some DLT allows preheating. I don't think uh, Illinois DLT allow allow the preheating. I think uh, I remember Pennsylvania when I was working on one steel bridge, good bridge damaged by the truck. I think uh, they use they preheat then you, then you use some like a V shape that kind of preheat pattern to strengthen in the bridge so to make the the steel or a bended web or flange back to its original position. So I think it depends on the DOT and also you have to look at the, the specs or special provisions to make sure they allow preheating because I remember, I could be wrong, I mean, I remember you mean no DOT does not allow preheating. Okay, um, second, we have more coming in. Um, the next question we have is, can you please explain the reason to change the inspection period to two years? I think that's a judgment call because uh, if you look at, well, I know in the North DOT, they have, they have a, like a structure menu regarding the, like a more than a dozen bridge inspection, like a routine bridge inspection, fracture critical bridge inspection, or some like a scour underwater inspection. I think, uh, I think that two year bridge inspection just for the routine bridges. So, so if, uh, for some special inspection, like a, like an emergency inspection. So when the bridge was hit or damaged by a truck or by something else, then they have to perform the emergency bridge inspection to make sure the bridge is still safe to open to traffic. Otherwise, they have to close down the, the bridge or posting the bridge so make sure the bridge is safe for the people to drive on it. Okay, the next question we have is for ship collision loads are usually very high compared to vehicle collision loads. Do you think it's feasible to consider collision loads in bridge design um, and is it very expensive? Well, you're right. I think uh, if you design the full collision loads from the boat, of course, it's a very expensive, a very expensive, and also you can design for it, just way too expensive. Typically, they, if you provide some dolphins, so that could mitigate the collision force, so they hit the dolphins first, so when, if the dolphin claps, so then they hit the bridge pier, then the loads could be much less. I forgot because I did, I use this, uh, I designed a pier for one of the major railway pier to prevent the collision falls long time ago. I think it all depends on the river, the location of the bridge. I think if it's a, if it's a near the ocean, then the collision loads should be much higher than the collision loads for the bridge at Mississippi River, I guess. All right. The next question we have is for Slab Town Road Bridge over the US over US 30 due to the impact load. Um, it seems that there was no shear studs. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't recall. I think they do have shear studs. Well, I think the I forgot when they built this bridge. I think every bridge built after 60 or 70s should have shear studs because that's how they invented composite girder design during that time. They should have shear studs. I think in the end, they just replaced the facial beam because uh, the the steel, the facial steel girder just bended too much. There's no way they can straighten in the steel girder or strengthen in the steel. So I. I think they just uh, closed down the bridge and then they replaced the whole facial good and then they replaced a portion, partial of the, the concrete deck as well. 
Okay, the next question we have is, uh, Ashto code doesn't seem to explicitly talk about how to consider preventative uh, of bridges from fire. What code do you think we could use in this case? I think that the building has a lot of experience regarding the fire protection. I think we might have to adopt some code the fire codes from buildings, but I don't know. It's up to the DOT because the DOT is the owner, so they should make a decision. Right now, as far as I know, all the steel bridges are not designed for the fire. So that maybe that's something in the future, the DOT should put something which could increase the vertical clearance because when you spray that thing on at the bottom flange, that could, increase the superstructure depth, then you can, which reduce the vertical clearance, so which means you have to raise the bridge by at least a one inch or half inch to uh, accommodate the fire protection material. I think, uh, I think uh, some research needs to be done for steel play gooders. I don't know whether, I think that this, the fire, because uh, the steel girder is open well, it's open to the air, not like a building. So a building is pretty much enclosed, so building is much easier. The fire is much easier to damage the steel members than the steel good to me. So I think they should do some research to test the steel good, how to prevent the fire in the open air environment. All right. Um, next question we have is, what are some commonly used scour repair methods uh, being used in the industry right now? Yeah, that's a very good question. To be honest with you, I think right now, all I know typically they use the rip wrap and the, the size of the rip wrap is based on the hydraulic study. So, but I heard some DOT do not consider that as a mitigation to prevent a scour. I think uh, unless you you inspect the bridge every year, so if you see some rip wrap wash away, then you put some new <laughs> rip wrap back. I think uh, I think uh, as a design, I think uh, we should what we should do is uh, after. After hydraulic study, I mean, they tell you the scar depth. So when you design the piles or drill shaft, so it means that there's no soil around it. So I think you have to design for move, which means you have to make the pile or drill shaft much deeper, much longer, because there's no soil around at the top portion of the, the pile or drill shaft due to the scour washout. All right, next question we have is, um, how can you manage inspectability of the bridge structure versus coating with fireproofing? Would coatings inhibit inspectability? Could you repeat the question again, please? Sure. So the first part of the question asks, how can you imagine, uh, sorry, how can you, how can you manage the inspectability of the bridge stru structure versus coating with fireproofing? Well, that's a very good question. It's new to me. I haven't think about it. Maybe you can, show me, is... you can show me your email. Let me think about it. We can discuss this issue. That's a very good question because, uh, well, I think typically, when they put off the fire, then they should be able to inspect the bridges. Well, the coding, that kind of thing, I don't know. Well, I think most time, if it's caused by fire, it's on the steel girders, then typically the girder will be severe damage. I think most likely you have to replace that portion damage the steel girders. That's very difficult to repair the coating. I don't know. Well, for conventional painting, I don't think that they can prevent the fire. I mean, damage. 
Yeah, it should be an email we can discuss a little more. That's a very good question. I think I, I think I need some more research to be done. I mean, well, at least the owner of DOT should put this topic in their research topics so they can hire some university to run the research for them. Yeah. Um, okay, well, Brian, if you'd like to discuss this further, we can definitely connect you with uh, David. Um, moving on to the next question, we have for Pennsylvania box girder steel corrosion, almost all steel is corroded. What do you think is the main reason and how to prevent such corros corrosion and PPC bridge design in the future? I think uh, to me, there are a couple of things. I think uh, the easiest thing is to increase the concrete cover. So that's the easy way to prevent the steel strength corrosion. The next thing is to use some non corrosive material like a uh, carbon fiber. I forgot the name, like uh, uses some, not uses steel strength. I think, uh, I think in Michigan DOT, has been using some like a carbon fiber, I forgot the full name, a strand to replace the steel strand, so which is not, well, they won't be corroded. What the problem is with the cost, with the premium, I heard the cost is much higher than the steel strands, and also that carbon fiber strand was invented by Japanese, I don't know, they still have a pattern or not. If they do still have a pattern, which means the cost could be even higher unless the pattern expires and every, everybody can make the carbon fiber strand. All right, the next question we have is for the Tacoma collapse um, was a consequence of the dynamic instability due to a phenomenon called structural flutter, when a variable superimposed horizontal load produced by wind gust effect increases the wind loads. Um, many texts erroneously describe the failure as an example of resonance, a completely different effect. To avoid this type of collapse, collapse uh, referring to the flutter, what would you recommend? Well, typically right now for all the major bridges, along span bridges, such as uh, suspension, cable stay, or arch bridges, you have to run the wind tunnel testing to make sure, I mean, the bridge is stable under different wind loads, certain wind loads make sure they are stable. Typically, you can improve the bridge stability by using deeper girders, heavier girders, or you can use some dampers to reduce the vibration. All right. Um, I think that concludes our questions. I don't see any more. Uh, new questions for now. If at any point anybody does have any additional questions or would like to get in contact with David, um, you can either contact him directly or you can let us know and we will put you in contact with him. Um, but this concludes our session for today. David, thank, thank you, you so much for this amazing session. Um, I know our, our audience really, really enjoyed it. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.